never been this age before. So I'll be 70 in a couple of months. And thank you. Uh, and someone here was saying, well, you're a little young to talk about aging and aging creatively, but can I start now? Uh, so this was on my 65th birthday at a restaurant in Ballard called Two Shoes Barbecue. And uh, I saw that horse in the lobby and I jumped right on top of it. My friend Bill gave me a quarter and it really did start up and I started giggling and he snapped the picture. And you know what? People walked by and I didn't care <laughs> at all. Because it doesn't matter as long as I'm not hurting anyone else. It's okay for me to act however I want to act, right? Yeah. yeah. Here, here. Today we're just going to talk about a couple of things which most of you probably already know. But I'm going to ask you if you'll be willing to share as we go along. So we might uh, either bring, bring around the mic as we go, or I might just ask you to shout out, and I'll repeat what you say so everyone can hear it. You don't have to share if you don't want to. We'll be talking about how are you <laughs> aging, and what are some steps some people are taking to age positively, and how can you have more fun as you age? So these are my parents, Ralph and Clara, and they lived to be 95. They were married over 70 years, and they died 30 days from each other. They were madly in love. I miss them terribly, but I was blessed to have them as my parents. They showed me and my brother unconditional love, and they were very positive about their lives and their ages. They did not tell silly ageist jokes about, oh no, now I can't see or hear or walk or comprehend or remember anything or pee. Um, they, didn't, they didn't make those jokes because they just took each day as it came and they were happy for whatever they got. Um, so I will say that when I was in college, I asked my dad how they were doing. How are you and mom doing? I was probably 20, or 20, or 20 years old, and probably one of the first times I actually thought about them. <laughs> they were, they were uh, 60, because they had me when they were 40. And I just said, you know, how, how are you doing? Started some empathy, maybe, towards my parents. <laughs> and my dad said, well, we're contented. And if any of you are from Seattle area, you know that Incarnation was the Carnation Milk Farms. And their slogan was, contented cows give him great milk. And I thought, in college, contented? My parents are contented? They're content? <laughs> Seemed a little bovine to me, a little benign, and a little boring. And I thought, that's all? They're, no, they're 60 years old, and they're merely content? And it wasn't until about a decade later, I was doing some writing, and I looked up the definition of content, and it says, satisfied. So there is nothing better than content. And in these days, everything has to be uber and mega and awesome and super duper, but there's no super content. It's finished, it's as good as it gets and it's wonderful. And I began to look at them with new eyes, too. And then I began to see how they were going through their aging process. Because they had their, uh, their um, injuries and illnesses. They had strokes, heart attacks. Uh, my mother had a leg amputated. She was in a wheelchair the last seven years of her life. I was very blessed to be able to take care of them the last seven years of their lives. Um, but they had falls and all kinds of things happen. They had a home burglary while they were home. Oh, no. They survived a fire in their old, their old home in Montana. Um, they had a stillborn child um, before I was born. And so they had plenty of things happen to them. And I also teach a class on resilience, which maybe uh, I think is coming up in a, uh, another month. And uh, I think Alan is going to have, have me present that to you, too. So resilience is important. But I learned from them also that there are some steps that we can all take to age positively as we go along. 
Have any of you heard of Immanuel Kant, the philosopher? Immanuel Kant. Yeah. And he had a wonderful quote, which I'll misquote, but it's okay because basically what he's saying is the three starred items. He thought everyone should have something to do, something to look forward to, and someone to love. Those three with the stars were the ones that he believed were the way to happiness. Uh, one of my friends added something to believe in, so I had been giving this talk for a little while, and then I realized, I can't leave out one of the most important ones. And those of you who've seen that Third Act magazine back there, or seen any of my other writings in Third Act, know that I believe in order to be happy and to age positively, everyone also needs something to laugh about. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. If you don't have that, I don't know how you're going to get through the day. Also, you're free to take notes, or you can take pictures of the slides, but I'm going to send these slides to Alan, and he could send them all out to you. Or, or somehow get them to you, perhaps. So if you don't want to write that fast, don't worry about it. And we, we are also recording. Oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> I, the camera's right there. <laughs> yes, he's recording it, so you could also watch it again. Well, my dad also used to quote George Burns frequently. Of course, George said, if you live to be 100, you've got it made, because very few people die past that age. <laughs> and I'm sure most of you remember George Burns and how he entertained and worked until he was 100 years old, right up until a few days before he died. And he had us rolling. He had us laughing. So let's take this model that we just looked at, um, Immanuel Kant's words, and a couple other people added. Let's just look at it one at a time. All right, everyone needs something to do. And my dad used to say, uh, the trouble with doing nothing is you never know when you're done. <laughs> so we really need something to do. And, whoops. When I, was, uh, when I was working for a large bank, anyone remember Seattle Trust and Savings Bank? Mm -hmm. Local, yeah, a few local people. I worked there in personnel for about 13 years back in the 70s and 80s. Uh -huh. And I was in the compensation benefits department for a while and I taught pre-retirement classes mm. at about age 30. <laughs> but again, I just felt that people should know long before they retire what kind of benefits they're going to be getting. They shouldn't just look at some statement once a year. They should be getting that information, and they should think about it. And think about maybe, what are they going to do when they no longer work to live? And I heard lots of things from people, things like, are you kidding, Dory? I'm going to play golf. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, sit and watch all my favorite shows. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing nothing. And some would even say, I'm going to lie on the beach. Not in Seattle, but. <laughs> and I would kind of come back at them with, um, but, but what will you learn? And who will you teach? You'll still have plenty of time to lie on the beach. Because, you know, we have in this room, we'll talk about talents in a minute, but in this room, we have people who have learned millions of bits of information, you have experiences, you have a wealth of talents and gifts and knowledge, and it's okay to share that with others. It doesn't mean you have to be a teacher in the school system, but to um, share that with someone else, even by giving presentations like this. You know, B.B. King said, I never use that word, retire. And you might say, well, but look, at he played his guitar and sang. He was a performer. You can do that until you drop dead. Yes, you can. And he did. He, I think his last performance was about six months before he died. But it was also his attitude. I'm just going to keep doing it. Why should I stop? Now, some of you are thinking, Dory, are you nuts? I'm not going to go back to work, and I wasn't going to keep working after I retired from my uh, career. But I'd just like you to think about some things you could do with your talents. We all have gifts of the head, the heart, and the hands. 
gifts of the head is your knowledge, your experience. You have decades of experience and information, knowledge, learnings, some formal learning, some informal learning. Gifts of the heart, talents of the heart, include your ability to be compassionate, to help others, to teach others, to share, to do something to help someone else out, or just to listen. That's a gift of the heart. Another type of gift or talent is gifts of the hands. People who can build things, make things, create art, bake, knit, do construction. I don't really do any of those things. I, I can bake. But my, my gifts are more in the, the speaking, the writing, and, and the sharing um, of my heart. But I'm not a, a, a big builder. But I'll bet you there's some people in here that have those kinds of talents. So what I'd like to do now is to find out what kind of talents are in the room. Now, we're, we're not close enough to share with someone else, but we can have the mic come around, and you can also just shout out. So Beatrice is here with a mic, and think about what's one or, of your, or two of your talents or gifts. I'll start. I can tap dance to take me out to the ball game. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, I can crochet. Oh, good. Um, yes. OK. Uh, for the last 35 years, I progressively got more and more involved in family history genealogy. Oh yeah. So I spend a lot of time at my computer and, and have connected with so many cousins um, around the world and it's been amazing and I keep thinking of that I, I'm going to maybe share that with other people here who mm -hmm. might want to get into genealogy. Oh, that's a really important time. Today people are doing that more and more and it's really important to do before you can't do it anymore and it's a gift to your family. Yeah. Who else? Another talent. You can just shout it out. What can you do? Yes. I do Scottish country dancing. Scottish country oh, dancing. When there's, not, when there's no COVID. <laughs> when there's no COVID and someday we'll be able to do those things again. Yeah. Um, I am a writer and author and also uh, an organizer of people, but I no longer have that ability, but I still write. Thank you. Yeah, st you can still write. Thank you. I'd love, to, I'd love to see what you write sometime if you'd ever like to share. <laughs> okay, let's have a couple more. Talents in the room. Yes. Uh, I'm a watercolor artist. I make birthday cards for my floor. Uh, yeah, uh, good ideas. Also, um, I'm in February, I've been teaching sign language. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we need more people who learn sign language. She and I were having a conversation right before this about how now that I'm doing more presentations in person, I should have one of the masks that has the clear spot so that people can lip read. And that would be really essential. And I will go out on Amazon and check that out. Um, when we do presentations on Zoom, people can see my whole face. Yeah. And, and if they need delivery, they can. But yeah, I apologize. OK, let's have one more person who wants to share a talent or a gift. I'm writing my memoirs for my grandchildren. Uh -huh. Excellent. Thank you. I, so it, we actually got applause on that. That's good. And, and anybody can write down stories that they remember. You don't have to worry about the, the punctuation and the grammar to start with. Just get those stories out of your mind because your grandkids, they'll, they can correct the grammar later. Uh, <laughs> just get the information out there. Yeah, thank you. Well, so this room has a lot of talents. We have a lot of talents in this room. And can you imagine what it would have been like the last couple of minutes if I had said, talk about something you don't do very well, or you can't do, or you hate to do? <laughs> that wouldn't have been much fun, would it? It's fun to hear what people can do. And you can still, as we just learned, use some of those talents as you age, whether or not they were from a job that you had, or from a, uh, some kind of class that you took or the, what, the, some information you learned early on in your life. So I'd really like you to consider, so what's next for you? What can you do with some of those talents or gifts? 
just because I can tap dance doesn't mean I'm going to tap dance for people uh, or you know, take this, set the world on fire, tap dancing from now on. Because the only song I can tap dance to is Take Me Out to the Ball Game. And this group knows the song, but a whole bunch of younger people don't, so it's just not as much fun. But you can use your talents right here at Bayview. Uh, excuse me. Heartstone. Heartstone. I worked there for six years. Yeah, can't I stop know. saying it. Right here at Heartstone, you, a lot of you, we just found out, many of the talents can be used right here. And with your group, and um, I'm sure you have groups, or at least now that people are vaccinated, they will be able to share in their groups a lot more. Um, Albert Einstein said, creativity is intelligence, having fun. Oh. Come on. Let's use that intelligence that we all have to do something fun. So just back to um, everyone needs something to do. You don't have to answer this out loud, but do you have enough to do? Some people really do want to clear their calendars. But <laughs> there's some people who, kind of mid-morning or you know mid-afternoon, kind of like, huh, sure wish there was something. One more thing. So, so kind of think about, is there one terrific thing you could add to your day or your week or your month? And keep thinking of that. You might even write, if you are taking notes, you could even write that down. Look for something different or fun to do or to learn or to share with someone that you have something to do on your calendar. Which brings us to our next point in our little model. Something to look forward to. Now, there's all kinds of ways you can look forward to something. Back to George Burns, I look to the future because that's where I'm going to spend the rest of my life. <laughs> and he did have that long hundred year life. Susan Sarandon, actress, says, I look forward to being older when what you look like becomes less of an issue and what you are is the point. Well, I look forward to something tangible, which is my grandson, Wyatt. I look forward to seeing him. They live in California, but fortunately I get to go there. I drive 12 hours to the Bay Area, <sighs> but, but I, I don't feel comfortable on planes yet. But, um, but you know, yeah, I, I have all my trips plotted. Um, so that I can so that I can see him and of course they, they'll come up here for Christmas but that's something to look forward to um, not everyone has grandkids but there are all kinds of things you can plot on your calendar so I'd like to hear from a couple of you just like we did a minute ago would anyone like to share either an actual event that's coming up that you are looking forward to or a, a class or a zoom session or a phone call with your family or a friend or anything that you're looking forward to. Could be dinner. <laughs> I look forward to uh, taking another trip, yeah. traveling. Can you share where you might go? Well, uh, I, I speak both Spanish and Russian, and uh, I know I'll go to one of those countries where I can use my skills in the foreign language. Wow. Great. wow. And then there's always just using your Spanish or your Russian whenever you can here, right? Well, you do something about Putin while you're there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we have an ambassador who's going to Russia to do something about Putin. <laughs> I am looking forward to a wedding in Minneapolis oh. next weekend. Oh, Ooh. yay. Coming right up. Nice. Hey, a wedding. Enjoy. Nice. Who else has something to look forward to? My son and daughter-in-law are taking me and her mother to Hawaii in February. Ooh. Oh, man. Yeah. And are you checking any bags, and how big are they? I'm looking forward to my granddaughter's college graduation in April. Oh, oh that's that's coming right up. What's the college? Where? University, University of Michigan. Oh, University of Michigan. All right, let's take two more. What are you looking forward to? Two more people. Oh, 
we met. That's so true. Yeah. Are you trying to get her to talk? Sorry. <laughs> so we have, I think on this side we have, yeah. Oh, you're making me work today. Yeah, she's going to work off. So she has extra dessert tonight. Don't you say a word. She's been running. I'm sorry, I didn't actually see who had. Oh, yeah, raise your hand. Yeah, oh, see Hopefully in January, I'm looking forward to going to Egypt. Ooh, Egypt? Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Cairo? Cairo, yeah. And we're sailing down the Nile River. Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, no. but, but, <laughs> only if you understand the sign language. Because, <laughs> because uh, it is up going to that group. Oh, we wow. have an interpreter. Wow. The interpreter. Wow. So we're oh, all communicating the sign language. Nice. Yeah, that is our deal. Okay, we have one last person here, the gentleman in the center. Our author. I'm looking forward to uh, election night for the mayor of Seattle because my granddaughter is on the staff of Lorena Gonzalez. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. Thank you. All right, we have plenty to look forward to, and you can always add something to that calendar so that you can move it forward, as we say, move it forward. Uh, so, moving on to the next part in our little model, something to believe in. This is one that my friend added, and it does not have to be a faith or a religion. So, for example, Muhammad Ali said, service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. And I know many of you have probably done all kinds of things to help people out, whether it's writing checks or whether it's being in person. It's tough right now to do anything in person um, because of COVID, um, but there is always something that we can do, even if it's phone calling, to remind people of a meeting here at the, at the Hearthstone, or um, any kind of, um, I forgot to ask you before I started, do you have um, opportunities here for people to volunteer in some way or help out or organize a group or not since COVID. Yeah, Alan, Alan says yes. Let's find out what he's. There, there are a few. So Suzanne is teaching sign language, and then we have a monthly speakers bureau, and we have uh, somebody who led a card group earlier today. We had somebody who's teaching watercolor on Tuesday. Uh, we have different groups here and there. Um, but as far as doing like community service in and around yeah. here, yeah, that's something that's on hold, unfortunately. Yeah, but if anybody has a passion that they want to share, I am super happy to put it on the schedule and promote it. There, there were ha before COVID, there were people that did work with the children up at the school. Oh yeah, so before COVID, she says there are people who work with the children up at the school. In fact, I was going to mention that. I'll, I'll go to this slide next. Um, I do support Habitat for Humanity. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I have been on five Habitat trips. Oh, have you? Um, one to Zambia, which is the picture on the left. Oh, wow. Um, to India, the picture on the right. Good for you. Um, to El Salvador and to Honduras and to China. Oh, and it's, I can't wait until we can go do that again and build houses for people. You know, Habitat's entire mission is everyone deserves a decent place to live. So, uh, have, you but, ever, have you ever been on a trip with the Carters? No, I don't know the Carters. Oh, you know the President Carters. Oh, the Carters. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of local people. Um, no, I have not done a Jimmy Carter build. However, the woman who it has always been my habitat leader um, is Jessie Strauss. She lives at, um, I had to call her in Broadview, and Jessie is 83, and she just stopped doing her last habitat-led trip uh, two years ago, right, with COVID. But Jesse um, has done Carter, Jimmy Carter builds. Um, they're mostly local, and I, I, I will do some domestic builds, but so far I've, I've gone to other countries because then I get my travel in, and I try to practice my Spanish, but it's un poquito. <laughs> um, no bueno. Um, but I do have a slide here. There are some things, again, maybe once COVID has uh, eased, we can just hope that everyone gets their vaccine. Um, there's an organization called Reading Partners that has started in several elementary schools in Seattle, they're nationwide, but several elementary schools in Seattle, and they were going pretty strong right before COVID, but they just need people to read to elementary school children for one hour a week. And 
or listen, or listen to the children read their lesson for one hour a week. And they have found that just one hour a week of additional time outside of class that students can even increase their reading level by a whole grade, uh, grade level in about 10 weeks because people, some kids just need additional time to practice reading and to have someone read to them. Um, it's an amazing program, but you can also do it um, by Zoom. So um, we can find out about, so Beatrice took a picture of that slide. Food banks, of course, always need help, and it doesn't have to be lifting heavy things. There are phone calls and things you can get on telephone trees and help people out. Um, and then how many of you know about Northeast Seattle Together, NEST? Uh -huh. And it's right here again. COVID brings some things to a halt. But Northeast Seattle Together has many ways for people to volunteer. Uh, and the Greenwood Senior Center, or Fitting Neighborhood Association, fabulous organization, and they're very close. And again, um, be thinking about it, even if, um, even though COVID is uh, squashing a few things. So other than a religious faith, what do you believe in? So I believe in Habitat for Humanity. I believe in uh, teaching sign language because so many people need it, but also I believe in that I should be able to be seen, and she reminded me I needed the different kind of mask with the clear plastic, and I believe in that. I believe everyone should be able to see someone lip read, so I will get one of those masks um, today, as soon as I get home. So what do, you, what do you believe in? What do you value? Would anyone care to share, again, other than a religious faith? Is there a cause? What's that? Cause it. Fun. I believe in fun, yeah. <laughs> I believe in fun. Very oh. good. Oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. oh, oh, oh no, oh no. Oh, that's okay. I'll get, I'll try to fix it while we're, they talk for a while. Okay. Yes, talk. Oh. oh, this is out, this is out too. I believe in the power of poetry. Oh, it all went down? The power of what? Oh no, the power this, all went uh, Yeah, my mic is out. No, and what? of course, Alan just quickly went to the restroom. Well, Hold on. <laughs> okay, go. I believe in the power of the common good. Oh, yeah. And the power, the, the power of the common good uh, requires that uh, you uh, assume that others uh, are have the essential qualities of humanity, which is listening, uh, doing good things, uh, and so on. The power of the common good. Uh, is in diminished supply yeah. these days. Mm -hmm. Oh, hello. Oh, I'm so good. sorry. I'm learning the whole thing. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. And yes, the common good is important. Can you all hear me OK? Yep. It's part of it's coming back now. Oh, here we go. Oh, good. You're doing a good thing, Beatrice. I don't know what I did. But Let's see. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I did. whatever you did. <laughs> so I believe in the power of Beatrice to oh. fix the <laughs> AV system. But I have to figure out the light. That's all right. We'll get it. All right. Who else? Does anyone else like to share anything that they believe in? I believe in the equality of people. Oh, yes. I believe in the equality of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Equality. Mm -hmm. It's getting darker and darker in here. <laughs> All right, we'll take one more. What, is, what do you believe in? What do you support? Could be the American Lung Association or the, you know, is there something you really believe in that you want to you wanna support? Yes? Hospice. Hospice, yes, please. I'm a hospice worker. I, I've been trained uh, about six years ago now, and I do enjoy it. If, I know that may sound strange to some people, but any of you who have seen hospice work or um, had someone you know in hospice, then yes, I actually enjoy working uh, and with hospice patients. All right, thank you. So, moving on. And the fourth one, which uh, Emmanuel Kant definitely suggests, is that everyone needs someone to love. Mm -hmm. Now, oh, sorry. this doesn't need to be romantic love. 
These are my parents' hands. I've already shown you their faces, and they were madly in love. They could hardly stop holding hands, and if you think that's sappy, I never did think it was sappy. I thought it was wonderful. Um, but it doesn't have to be a partner. You can love many people. Um, for example, here I am on the left with my grandson when he was only one, little clown noses, and then on the top right is uh, me and my blonde friend Lori. I've known her for 42 years, and I love her. She's my friend. She's my best friend. And on the bottom right is a picture of me and my daughter. Of course I love her. And here's a picture of, well, Lori's on the top again. There's Lori. And then on the bottom um, right is my friend Janice. We went to high school together and lived together in college at the University of Washington. And Bill and Ron are two other good friends I've known since, well, probably almost 50 years. So um, these are, and, and now they're all friends. So I brought them together, Aww. and um, I have fabulous neighbors who live on Queen Anne Hill, and our street, as soon as COVID shut us down on March 20th of 2020, that Friday, we had a socially distanced, huge circle of lawn chairs Aww. in the middle of the street so that we could have fun and talk and still laugh. So um, doesn't have to be a person either. This is my kitty cat, Pearl. And uh, when I go to Montana or I go to Oceanside to the beach, I bring her. She's a, she's a car kitty. She can come along and we have fun. And she, I, I can open the door and she'll always come back, run around the beach or around Montana. So it doesn't have to be a human. So I would like you to think for a minute, who do you love? Friends, neighbors, family, kids, grandkids, pets? that you don't have to share, but just think about, do you have someone or something to love? And I hope you do. And it's okay to say it out loud to your, the person or the thing that you love. And the more we can, the, the longer that love lasts and the stronger it gets, I think. All right, now, this is my favorite one. Of course, I added it to <laughs> famous philosophers model, but of course Dory has to mess with it. So, something to laugh about. I think if you don't have something to laugh about, it's going to be a tough day. And I mean that every day. Um, I think that it's essential to laugh as much as you can, as often as you can. Um, I cannot remember if it was Norman Lear or Carl Reiner, so I apologize. I need to find out who said this. But he was talking about um, the belly laugh. You've all heard the, the, the words, the phrase, belly laugh. And it really means someone who is laughing so hard, they actually bend over and sometimes even grab their middle. And this is universal. Every single culture, when people laugh hard, they double over. <laughs> And, and then you've also heard of the, the knee slapper. <laughs> wow, that's good. And sometimes it's combined with the belly laugh. It's just, oh, man. It is, it is just like a sneeze, they say. It is, um, you can't help it. I went to a laughing workshop once. You're you probably aware of them. Maybe you put them on. I uh, don't put on laughing workshop. A laughing yoga? or Yeah, well, it's just a, it taught you how to laugh. Yeah, I went to a work, laughing workshop once, which basically just got everybody laughing, laughing, laughing. It's like you're practicing, but anyway, once you know how you, it's kind of catching when somebody is laughing, and everybody else does. Uh, so yeah. it is catching. Have any of you ever seen, a, a, either in person or in a video of some kind, someone absolutely cracking up, and you start to laugh yeah. even though you weren't yeah. part of the conversation? Yeah. 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 Remember Carol Burnett show, yeah. and they yeah. would crack each other up, which was one of the first shows that allowed that to well, it was live, but the, you know, allow it to be on camera, and instead of people thinking how unprofessional, you know, <laughs> Tim Conway couldn't remember his line, or he added the line, or Harvey Corman absolutely broke up and started to giggle. Instead of thinking how unprofessional, you're not a good uh, um, actor. People loved it, 
and it caused us to giggle and giggle at home. We weren't even in the room. <laughs> but yeah, if you can find something to laugh about. And actually, um, this is my friend Sam Altman. Remember my blonde friend Lori I was talking about earlier? This is her dad, and he's such a great guy. He passed away a year ago. Uh, but when he was 92, about three years ago, um, I said to him, as I often did with my parents, how did you get to be you know, 92 and have such a great, great attitude and always have a laugh ready and smile a lot? And he said, your attitude is everything. You have to make living fun by being positive and looking forward to every day. And laughing overcomes troubles. And I believe it. I think it's without a doubt <laughs> the way that I need to live my life. So I'm going to tell you a joke. <laughs> a 65-year-old woman had a heart attack and was sent to the hospital. And while she was on the operating table, she actually died. And she went to see God. And she said to God, is my time up? And God said, no, no. You've got 30 years, 2 months, and 14 days. <laughs> and so they saved her. She, she woke up on the table or in her room. And she thought, well, if I'm going to live for another 30 years, I'm going to have some work done. So she stayed in the hospital. She had a full facelift, tummy tuck, <laughs> breast implants, <laughs> teeth and ears, beautiful, had her LASIK surgery on her eyes, and she had her hair colored. And about two weeks later, after she was somewhat recovered, she left the hospital, walked out the door, got hit by a bus, and died. <laughs> and she went up to see God again. And she said, God, why didn't you stop that bus from hitting me? I thought I had another 30 years. He said, I didn't recognize you. Oh. <laughs> I like it. Thank you. How many of you were in the, uh, you may not remember, but way back in June, uh, I did a presentation here called What's Age Got to Do With It? And I told two naughty jokes at the end. Beatrice and Alan remember them. <laughs> well, when we're finished here today, I may tell those two jokes again if you don't remember them. And if you do not want to stay to hear naughty jokes, then you can leave. We'll wait till the people who don't want to hear them. There's no swearing in them at all. Dory, yes. don't you think also the, uh, the thing to do is to learn to laugh at ourselves? I think that's yes. what has been the hardest for me. But if you can oh. somehow not take yourself so seriously, you can get through Who's life more. Uh, better. <laughs> I agree. Um, yes, that's definitely true. I only bent over to pick up my paper. <laughs> it happened while you were gone too. Yeah. But but Beatrice got it back. I just hit the number three over there. Maybe I'll. Go I just hit the number three and it didn't do anything. So. And we'll get that. <laughs> so yes, being able to laugh at yourself is important. Um, my dad uh, taught me and thank you taught me and my brother that. Um, if you want to foil a bully, laugh at yourself first. Make fun of yourself first. And he, uh, my dad had freckles, and they grew up in a very small town. He's probably the only one with freckles. And people made fun of him. And he made fun of his freckles first. He would say, oh yeah, I just fell in a mud puddle. I haven't washed my face all day. And he just completely stopped them in their tracks because there wasn't anything that they could say. And so he told my brother to do the same thing. My brother um, was born with a, a crossed eyes when he was a little baby and had surgeries to straighten them out. But then he wore glasses from the time he was four. And when he got in school, kids would call him four eyes and stuff like that. But my dad had already said, hi, my name's Brady and I'm four eyes. <laughs> so that there wasn't, you just take the wind out of their sails. And uh, so if you can, yeah, if you can laugh at yourself, You've, you've got it made. Um, as long as we don't laugh at other people behind their backs, I mean, <laughs> then that's okay. But. So I, I did write an article for Third Act Magazine two or three issues ago, um, and my, my article is called Laughter on the Menu. And really what I was talking about is know what makes you laugh. Some people laugh at you know people falling down on the ice or, uh, again, babies toddling and uh, knocking into something, or funny dog videos, or actual shows like Carol Burnett, or uh, George, George Burns, or um, 
Now remember Irma Bombeck, people who write uh, fun books or who are on TV, but know what makes you laugh and start looking for it. Get some more. Um, save up your funny stuff. Have a comedy cache so that you can go to it and reread the joke or reread the or rewatch the story or the video. Um, and if you have a funny friend, someone who always lightens your day, call them more often. <laughs> go see them. Well, on Zoom. Um, but carve out each, each day, carve out some time for your laughter. I actually start every day with 30 minutes of comedy. I'm looking at, like, you know, again, cat videos, dog videos, baby videos, um, silly things, or uh, jokes, memes, shows, really? books. Yeah. Huh. So, yeah, are you going to say something? No, I was just yeah. interested in what you were saying. <laughs> well, um, I, and often I end each day with about 30 minutes too, so I can erase what happened on the news <laughs> in my mind so I can sleep. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I do recommend it. And uh, some of you have now heard that I was trained as a hospice volunteer. And one of the reasons that I can enjoy it and that I do do it is that my parents always talked about death and dying and medical issues when I was growing up. And it was just common. It was easy for us to hear and to understand. And they'd tell us if one of their friends had a problem or was admitted to the hospital and what they had. and. Um, and we learned some empathy that way and also got to be comfortable with talking about medical things, planning for your death and your dying. And uh, they also could make jokes about it. By the time I was in junior high, my brother and I both knew that our parents wanted to be cremated. And my dad always used to say, I want you to sprinkle my ashes over the 14th hole of his favorite golf course because that's where he got a hole in one. And I really, we were hoping he wasn't kidding because we did that after he died. But he really was able to make jokes about death and dying. So in one of my presentations, which is called Death is the New Sex, um, I do bring up some of the, the um, lighter side of the death and dying. And, oops. There you go. My mother, for example, used to say all the time that she wanted her headstone to read, I told you I was sick. <laughs> Did you do that? Did no, we didn't do that because she wanted to be cremated and we sprinkled her ashes in Montana where she grew up. But she, that was one of her jokes. Um, but then she loved this one. This is a, a joke about uh, a funeral. Evan would be so pleased. Look, Tupperware. <laughs> but you know, and, and some of these, some of these are not. They don't hit home to some people, especially if you've recently had a death in your life, and um, you're you're still hurting from that. I understand that. Um, I also think it's okay to consider that grief is an extension of love. It means you're holding a place in your heart for someone that you loved, and love is never is never wrong, you know, so um, it's okay to also have fun with that friend or that loved one who died um, a, a little bit at a time, of course, but by making some light of it sometimes. Um, my dad also felt that you should have fun no matter how old you are. So for example, this is my dad roller skating at age 80 <laughs> at my daughter's roller skating birthday party. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he would come by and have another piece of cake or drink some more lemonade and then he'd go around the rink again and people at the tables next to us would say do you know that is that your dad or your grandfather or what you know and what why are you letting him skate <laughs> and I would say let him I am not his parent and because he always said to us if I can't do what I want when I'm 80 when can I Good point. <laughs> yeah, and that has to do with having as much fun as you dare. I do not recommend roller skating <laughs> to anyone here. <laughs> I am not going to ever go roller skating again. However, a week ago, I went to tour the Kraken facility. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Have you been? Okay, that would be a great field trip the next time you guys can do field trips. Yeah. But it's, it's three ice rinks in one location, and... Wow, just to watch people 
ice skate, because I used to love to ice skate. How many people ice skated? Oh, lots of people in here. How many roller skated? Yeah, and how many would do it again? All oh, right! I'm so impressed. You know what? For the little two and three year olds, they have those little skating aids, and they're like walkers. I love that. And the kids just push them ahead of them so that they won't fall as easily. I think we should have those for our age, for us. <laughs> would you go would you go skating slowly and carefully with a friend if you had up like a walker on, on the skating rink? Maybe, yeah. I would. Then I would go. But I'm a little nervous about going now. So the question is, oh hi. What can you do to have more fun? So can anyone think of one thing that they could do to have a little more fun in their lives, even if it's read more funny books. Well, we could dress up for Halloween. We could dress up for Halloween. You could dress Friday. up for Halloween? <laughs> yeah. Are you having a Halloween costume party? Yes. yes. No. We're Next having, Friday. We're having a costume contest. Oh, okay. A Halloween? Okay, we need to hear the details. We're doing, so uh, we're doing a Halloween matinee every day next week, and then we're going to culminate on Friday with the best of all horror movies, The Night of the Living Dead. But that's going to be the 11. The costume contest is going to be at 10.30, and it's going to be for staff and residents. Yeah. So residents can come in costume, they can be part of the party, they can have their photo taken, or they can just laugh at staff. Whatever you want to do. Whatever, whatever makes you laugh. <laughs> Is anyone in this room potentially planning on wearing a costume on Halloween? Oh, oh Alan. Sure, people. Come on, come on. How about just a mask? I don't mean this mask. <laughs> just a mask. Yes, we will have a box of different costume masks and things if you don't want to prepare one for yourself. Look at that. The ball people have a wig. Okay. The bald people get to wear a wig. I love it. I love it. He, well, I repeated what he said. So. Oh, good. Well, I really encourage you to actually think about how can I have more fun? And plan it. Put that on your calendar. Something to look forward to. Something to do. And something you love. Because I know you all love to have fun. Who doesn't? So think about that in our little model as well. So again, I don't know how to act my age. I've never been this age before, and I don't think there are any rules, and besides that, rules are meant to be broken. Good rules, um, I mean, just the, the ones that are okay to be broken. Like, I won't take my mask off, because I don't think I should. But there's other rules, like getting on a horse in the middle of a public place. Why not? Um, my dad always used to say also, being one day older only matters if you're a banana. So don't let that stop you. Although I do have to be honest, when I saw him roller skating at age 80, my heart skipped a beat too. <laughs> so it wasn't like, oh, good for dad. It was, oh, no, he's really out there. Yeah. Shirley right here is directing me to read her sock. Okay. She has this beautiful sock on. Age only matters if you are wine, cheese, or banana. I love it! Very good. Okay, I'm going to change this. Wine, cheese, or a banana? See? Great minds. And comedy. And I'm sure you've seen this before. Wrinkles mean you laughed. Gray hair means you cared. And scars mean you lived. I heard a new one the other day, which I might put in here instead. And it was, wrinkles are where I keep my memories. Um, wow. Isn't that wonderful? No. Yeah. No? <laughs> well, okay, but remember, if you get rid of the wrinkles, God isn't going to recognize you when you go up to heaven. So, <laughs> you got you to have something natural on you. You might not know who you are. <laughs> so here's our model. Um, and I guess I just uh, kind of close it out by saying, you know, which of these could you do more of? So think about that, and if anyone has anything they'd like to share about, you know, what, is there anything you heard here today that you would pick up on, add to your life? I would just simply like to compliment you. I just love your energy, and I think we all do. And um, 
Thank you so much for sharing with us and caring for us and um, giving us your wisdom. <laughs> oh, well, you're welcome, and it's not my wisdom, it's my parents and annual taunt. But you can tell I love to do it. Um, and by the way, this is a bus stop in Montreal. They have adult-sized swings. Aww. Why not? Who said we should stop swinging just because we're over 10? Um, I don't think we ever grow up, we just learn how to act in public, and that's me at age four. And check out that baggy underwear. I don't know what that was all about. I'm sure that wasn't part of the costume, but um, yeah, we, we try to learn how to act in public, except when we get on the horse at Two Shoes Barbecue. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments before we adjourn? I want to hear your jokes. Okay. Yeah. All right, now, <laughs> if anyone does not hear, want to hear a naughty joke or two, two naughty jokes, then you may leave and nobody will uh, judge you. Sure. <laughs> and I, I guarantee they are not um, profane. There's no profane. All right, joke number one, and you'll remember them if you heard, if you heard them in June. Joke number one, did you hear about the older man in the retirement community who came and sat down by the older woman in the retirement community and said, you know, for $5, I'll make love to you over on that rocking chair. And she looked at him and she grabbed her purse. And he said, but for $10, I'll make love to you over on that sofa. And she looked at him and she grabbed her purse. And he said, but for $20, I'll take you back to my room and we'll have a romantic evening with wine and music and it'll be the most fun you've had in years. And she grabbed her purse and looked at him and then slowly she took out a $20 bill. <laughs> and he said, oh, you want to go back to my room? And she said, no, I want it four times in that rocking chair. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> There's my dad. All right, and the last joke is, you heard about the 60-year-old um, who went to the doctor for his regular checkup. And the doctor said, we are in great shape. Um, checkup is fine. All your meds and all your, your stats look good. Uh, but may I ask, for your medical records, how old was your father when he died? And the 60-year-old man said, did I say my father died? My father's 80. He teaches samba lessons and he still skis. He's in great shape. And the doctor said, oh, I'm sorry. Well then, may I ask, for your medical records, at what age did your grandfather die? Did I say my grandfather died? He's 100 years old. In fact, he's getting married in two weeks. <laughs> and the doctor said, why would your grandfather want to get married at age 100? Did I say he wanted to get married? 